New York, one of the most exciting cities in the tri-state area. It's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, John Candy and Joe Flaherty from SCTV. And wrestling great Killer Kowalski. Rita Stippo with Home Movies. Sitcom pilots for Dave. Pieces that won't be on the show. And stupid pet tricks. And now a man who only wants a hot meal at a fair price. David Letterman! Good morning, welcome to Late Night. My name is David Letterman. How many of you think I walk funny, huh? Yeah! Just uh, something there, I'm not sure. Apparently my mother tied my diapers wrong, was the problem. <laughs> uh, why have we got a show? What is the weather like outside? Is it still warm here in New York City? It was uh, uh, almost spring-like, wasn't it? Uh, uh, other parts of the country, it's not uh, still a little nasty, uh, ugly weather. And I get concerned, you know, if it's too cold, too many days in a row. I think something has gone wrong, you know? Uh, on the other hand, in the summertime, three or four days in a row, it's about 90, 95, gets up close to 100. No relief in sight. Guys walking around, their tattoos are beginning to run, you know? <laughs> I think to myself, well, maybe we've just broken out of our orbit and are getting closer and closer. To I worry needlessly about stuff like that, so uh, I hope things uh, clear up. Uh, did I tell you who's on the show? I guess not. I just arrived, didn't I? Um, we have a great show for you folks here tonight. I'm certainly glad you're with us. Uh, from a television show also on this network, SCTV, uh, John Candy and Joe Flaherty will be joining us. We have wrestling great Walter Killer Kowalski. We have a couple other things, some surprises, but the real reason, not that all this other stuff isn't reason enough to be here, but the real reason you should be excited about being here tonight in this studio, stupid pet tricks. Good heavens, it's really not that exciting. I mean, it'd be great, it'll be worth staying up for, but heavens, nothing like that. This is Paul Schaefer over here, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, boy, I'm terribly excited. We've only been on the air a couple of days, and uh, tonight we're debuting a very special segment, a new feature on Late Night. It's called Home Movies. And by home movies, we mean home movies. Here with our first installment of late night home movies, Rita Stippo, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Rita. Have a seat, if you will. Now, uh, Rita, the home movies that uh, you have brought us this evening, you took yourself? I did. And how long ago were they made? 1954. What kind of a, what kind of a, people laughed. Uh, uh, what kind of equipment did you use? Um, simple eight millimeter camera. Mm -hmm. and no Super 8. No Super 8. This mm -hmm. was pre-Super 8? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that really opened up filmmaking for you when they came out with the oh, Super 8. I can't tell you. Uh, what are we going to see? We're going to see a New Year's Eve party with my family. Mm -hmm. And um, we're making a lot of noise and having a lot of fun. A lot of noise, a lot of fun. Now, this yeah. was New Year's Eve 54 or 53 well, 54? I think it's 53 going now. It must 53. be 54 going into 55. Okay, so yeah. this would be all right. It's not that old. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, uh, people like uh, uh, Robert Altman, when they direct film, they use family members, and I guess that's pretty much what yeah, you've done here, huh? that's right, that's right, yes. I think they got their ideas from me. Okay. Uh, is, is there any more that you could tell us before we see uh, your home movies? Anything we should look for? Any kind of special technique that you pioneered? Or? Um, 
Well, I really can't think of anything that was special at that time, mm -hmm. but um, just pra practically um, basic movies. Basic home mm -hmm. movies. Home movies, okay. yeah, I'm afraid. Uh, I guess with uh, that, we're about now to see the uh, much talked about Rita Stippo films. Uh, no sound on these, right, Rita? No, no. Okay, no. Rita, if you can uh, narrate them for us, the folks in the studio take a look at the monitors at home. Oh, okay. here are the festivities. And Mary, that's my brother. Who is the, what's my your brother's brother, name? Big Dick. Uh, my Uncle Joe. There's your brother again. Mary. He's a colonel now. He's a colonel in, uh... in the army. And Chris and Uncle Mike just arriving, and that's me greeting them. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You have a little crown on there of sorts. Tiara. Yes, yeah. I was very regal that night. Uh -huh. Now we're having dinner and uh, drinking Daddy's wine. That's we're... my father, Mom on the left. We also saw this in The Godfather, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. It was uh, all balloons. Oh yes, we had a fun time. You know you're having fun when yes. you got balloons. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And you look a little. Uh, this is you. It's yes, a it's... lovely dress there, Rita. It's, uh, that's what I'm almost wearing. Okay. Now, this is midnight, and we brought out the noisemakers. That's Mom and my brother, Vic. Now, this kid won't stop, will No, you? no. He's a, he likes to kiss a what lot. What is he doing now? What is his name? My brother, Vic, is a colonel Vic? of the Army. Oh, that's the colonel. Who's the yes. guy with the mustache? Oh, uh, that's my little nephew. Oh, the one in the back? That's yeah, that... Dad. That's Vic No, the again. phony mustache. Or, oh, or was that Dad? No, that's Dad in the front. That's uh -huh. not phony. That's Uncle Mike. The little no, this... kid in the front is yeah. now a vice president at Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they have no dress code there, huh? <laughs> Uh-huh, Aunt Mary again. Well, yeah, I think we broke out the champagne. So how many people were in the cast, Rita? I think we had a cast of 14. Now, Dad, really? now Dad, Dad fell asleep. Yeah. He fell asleep. It's lights out for that guy, huh? Yeah. He had a little headache the next day. Yeah. But we were having a lot of fun still. Well, it looks like a lot of fun. Champagne oh. does things for you. Oh, my God. All hell Aunt is broken Mary. loose, Rita. <laughs> this is ugly. Aunt uh... Mary and Aunt Phil. Good heavens. <laughs> Very nice. Any uh, any films since that? Oh uh... uh, yeah, we had lots of films after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of vacation films, but uh, after that particular one, I think we simmered down to just plain old New Year's Day beers. Yeah. Well, it'd be hard to top that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a, a fun time. It was very nice of you to share your home movies with us, it was and my I understand you. Want to tell, us, tell us where you work. I work at NBC. NBC. Yeah. Congratulations <laughs> uh, on your job at NBC. If, if that's you. something to be congratulated it on. Is. I love in it. In my case, it is. Uh, we're, um, we love having you back. Thank you. It's really fun do. to be back. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate and your home movies. You. Rita Stipple, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up, John Candy and Joe Flaherty from SCTV. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. This is uh, only our uh, fourth night on the air, and I guess by now everybody in the country knows that we have one of these. But uh, they say, what else do you have back there, Dave? Well, we also have one of these. So... Okay, my next guest... It'll, it'll turn off in just a minute. I think that answers the question, why don't other talk shows have one of those? Uh, well, drive safely. Thanks for watching. Good night. Uh, Second City TV is a comedy show which uh, emanates in Toronto, Canada, and for a while it was being done out of Edmonton, uh, Canada, I believe. Uh, it's a terrific show, and it's uh, on every Friday evening at 12.30 here at NBC, and perhaps one of the uh, uh, fastest, uh, most... Uh, 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 well, I'm lost here. Let me just start over quickly becoming one of the most popular comedy programs on the air without a siren. The magic, the magic of SCTV is attributed to the fine writing and performing. That's certainly the truth. Uh, two of those folks are with us tonight, John Candy and Joe Flaherty. <laughs> gentlemen to be here. I'm, I'm uh, desperately sorry that I botched your introduction. What I was sorry. trying to say is uh, this is a show that uh, I have been a big fan of for a long, long time before it moved to uh, uh, NBC. And uh, the little remark there in the uh, opening uh, about it being a perfect match of great writing and great performing, I think, is uh, the hallmark of that show. And uh, you folks should be congratulated on that. 
Tell us about yourselves, eh? As they say. Uh, Joe, you are from originally not Canada, somewhere else, or yeah, from Pittsburgh. Canada? I'm yeah. from Pittsburgh, PA, and uh... that's it. Come on, Pittsburgh. Uh, how did you get involved with the, a... the, the Canadians from uh, Pittsburgh? Well, I went uh, up to Canada to work with the theater company, the SCTV. No, it was uh, Second City, Second mm -hmm. City Cabaret. And we wanted to open a theater up there, so we went up and uh, cast some people, very good people up there. Um, I was surprised to see the talent uh, just sort of floating around in Toronto. Matter of fact, Paul Schaefer, your musical mm -hmm. director, was up there at the time doing yeah. Godspell. Hi, Paul, yeah. how are you? Yes. You again. <laughs> uh, shut up. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we cast uh, John and Eugene Levy and... Uh, um, let's see who else was up there at the time. Gilda Radner and Danny Aykroyd. That was, they were in the original stage show. Yeah. So, uh, from there it was... What is, what is SCTV or S, uh, Second City? What is that for people who don't, may not really know what the organization is out of Chicago? Oh, you want me to say it? Sure, John, why don't you try one of these? <laughs> oh, okay, that's a tough one, though. Uh, Second City started in Chicago in 1959. It was originally uh, came out of the University of Chicago. When it was the West Compass Players, it was uh, the University of Chicago didn't have a theater department, and they created their own. And they being uh, Elaine May, Mike Nichols, Severin Darden, Del Close, Bernie Sollins, uh, Sheldon Patinkin. There was a lot of people who uh, I think Ed Asner was was part of that. Shelley Berman, Harry Truman, Harry yeah. Truman was part of that. <laughs> he had great stuff. A lot. Of, oh, he, he was, was terrific, funny. The yeah. blackouts he came up with. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact about him, the group scenes that he did, you know, were very risque at the time. Is that and, right? Uh, <laughs> he was very, very, very funny man. What, what was the, uh, what's the... the Learned a lot from him. <laughs> uh, what was the, in fact, some said that you were the next Harry Truman for a yes, while. Yes, they did yeah. for a long time, and uh, there's been a curse on my back. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been yeah, trying to change that, I've been trying to change that, but damn it, you can't sometimes. No, no, I know. People won't get off, you know? Yeah. Uh, what, is, what, what does a Second City refer to? What was the, what does that mean, Second City? What, uh, it was an article, I think, in the uh, New York Times, wasn't it? There were, uh, 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 New Yorker magazine. New Yorker magazine, yeah. uh, saying Chicago was second to New York in everything, mm -hmm. uh, in every way, which I don't know if everyone believes that or not. Chicago's <laughs> a fine town. It Toronto is, a fine, is town. a fine town also, where yes. you guys are now doing yeah. the show. Pittsburgh's a fine town. I Pittsburgh know. is all right, too. <laughs> Didn't get a huge response. <laughs> What about Monterey? Monterey. Beautiful place. Yeah. Um, now, when you were Queensville, doing... another place where I'm from. Queensville? Mm -hmm. and this is uh, in Ontario, yeah. outside of Toronto? Yeah. Uh, tell me about doing the show from... <laughs> no one? No one from Queensville? <laughs> tell me about doing the show from Edmonton. Is this, is this well, where we... the last cycle of shows came out of there? Yeah. We're notorious for... Uh... Selling out to the lowest bidder, you know? <laughs> we ended up there. Now, how does that no, happen? No, this is a no, major no, network television extravaganza, and they're doing it in Edmonton, a city of how big? Oh, geez, it's uh, 800,000 people now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, it's growing every day. It's, it's a big city. It's Boomtown. <laughs> Edmonton. <laughs> While we look up the exact population of Edmonton, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with John Candy and George Brown. The show, Bill Flaherty, uh, John Candy are here, and uh, we were just, uh, SCTV was uh, the last season of shows produced in uh, Edmonton. Yeah. Now, uh, again, that's not really Los Angeles or New York or any of the cities that we mentioned. Uh, how did it end up there, and what was it like doing it there? One Either of the one of you guys. One, or of you can... one of the owners of the show, uh, our show is like the, the movie The Producers. Uh, <laughs> kind of a tax deal? <laughs> a number of, a number of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm being bitter. <laughs> I didn't come through with that per diem. <laughs> I can say that now. My lawyers talk to me. I'm clear. <laughs> One of the owners, Dr. Allard, owns a TV studio in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, that's where we did the show. He, it was his, it was his, his studio, that's where we worked. Yeah. It, was it a, a nice, a enormous yeah. complex? Not an no, enormous no, complex. It's, it's, it's nice. very small, tiny little place. Mm -hmm. the, the staff and crew there were great. And yeah. the director there, yeah. uh, John Blanchard, incidentally, who shot who shoots all of our stuff, he's, he's really good. The show looks terrific. Yes. You would not guess that it comes out of anything uh, less than a first-rate operation. Uh, the city takes a bad rap, you know, but it's a real nice city, and uh, there's good people there. Yeah. 
Everybody was working real hard any, on the show. Any problems with doing a show out of Edmonton? Uh, getting people there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were begging a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. The technology in Edmonton is okay? Uh, well, yeah. for the, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a very modern city. It's, it's a boom town. It's, it's just sprung up. It's, there's oil there, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh... They got color TV last year. <laughs> That's real nice. <laughs> what about the control room? Do you ever have any trouble with the, uh... With the control room? Jeez, no, not really. You know, there was some... Uh... <laughs> Was, was that on one of those? I don't know. Ah, oh, the control room. We copied these and distributed them to the audience and our guests. Yeah. And uh, there was, uh, you never had trouble with uh, uh, hockey coverage? Uh, oh, on Wednesdays. Yeah, there you on Wednesdays. go. You should, should have just said hockey. I was, oh, hockey was I the I thought that was my cue, hockey. Okay. It's the Edmonton Oilers. Our crew would leave on Wednesdays to cover their game. Oh, yeah. So we were, we would just kind of hang around. <laughs> and we wait till they got back, and then we'd shoot some more. Okay. <laughs> I love your show. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a look at some uh, video videotape of. I guess this would be a night when the control room was there, huh? Uh, I, would, I hope so. This. Uh, what you want to tell us? What we're going to see, Joe? Or? Oh yeah, this is a Thursday night, so this was fine. We were. Uh, we did a Godfather parody, <laughs> and uh, this he'll was back terrific. By he'll the way. Back yeah. John this. will back yeah. me up on yeah. this. Because uh, he's a beautiful, beautiful Thank you human so being. much, <laughs> We did a, a parody of The Godfather. I was uh, Guy Caballero and uh, the president of the yeah. imaginary station, SCTV. And my personal life was somewhat like The Godfather. Now, in the movie, there was a scene with Al Martino and uh, Marlon Brando. Brando was a godfather and Martino was uh, his godson. And um, we did a takeoff on that. I was, uh, I was playing the Brando part. John was playing my godson, but he was... Johnny Pavarotti, uh, Luciano Pavarotti type. So, and this is that scene between the two of them when he's asking him for I need a, favor. a favor. Okay. Caballero, this part in this war opera is perfect for me. Mm. But this conductor, this letter Bernstein, he don't like me. He's saying the part is no good for me. I'll never get the part. <laughs> Don Caballero, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I gonna do, Don Caballero? What am I gonna do? You can act like a man, that's what you can do. Now, you leave this to me, and within a month, I promise you, you'll have that part. Well, a month is no good. They start rehearsals at the Met on Monday. Mm. Well, look, I'm going to talk to Tom Hagen, my consigliere. Mm -hmm. I'll send him to New York. He'll talk to this Leonard Bernstein fella. Well, this Bernstein, he's a tough guy. He won't listen to anybody, you know. Yes, mm. he will. I'm going to make him an offer that I think will be to his liking. Don't come here. I don't know how to thank you. If ever there's anything you want me to do for you, just don't hesitate to ask me. Well, you can start by uh, offering me some of that provolone. No way. Oh, come on, give me a little bite then. No, come on, share that. Gentlemen. We're going to pause here. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk some more with John Candy and Joe Flaherty. Welcome back, uh, Joe Flaherty and John Candy from SCTV. There are seven people performing on the show. Yeah. Do you people write most of the material that you perform? A lot of it. Yeah, not all of it. We do have writers that help. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it would be impossible, I think, to write and perform a 90-minute show yeah. every week. Do you, do you write things exclusively for yourself, or will you write something for John and vice versa? Or Yeah, we, um, we write pretty much for everybody, you know. Um, it's, uh, that's the good thing about it, is I can write a scene for John because I've worked with him so long, yeah. and he, vice versa. Yeah. Although, is there a, a pretty good relationship up there? Fist fights now, or are people uh, no, grabbing a, hair? a knife every now and then, but really, it's, it's, <laughs> it's nothing really, you know. Uh, is that, uh, uh, now this show has actually been in production for a long time, hasn't it? Since 75. Yeah. I think it was yeah. 75, Six. 76, Six. yeah. yeah. We got the idea in 75, so yeah. it was a while to figure it out. <laughs> it's terrific. We have another piece of videotape that we want to get to before we yes. have to uh, leave. Our 83, take two. Cut! All right, we'll take five and try it again. 
thank you. Hello, I'm John Houston. I've been directing Shelley Winters all day long. And what do they give me? Light beer. Here, Mr. Houston, try the cow. The cow? Sure, the great malt liquor from Blitz. I wonder why they call it the cow. She's loose! Give me that cake! Let me you that cake! John Candy, Joe Flaherty, you guys are terrific. The entire show is terrific. And we have to pause for station identification. Oh, my. Oh, my. Thank you very much, Paul Schaefer. We have plenty of fun while you folks are away. Uh, welcome back to the show. As you may or may not know, uh, it has been about a year and a half since the last time I had my own show, and in the course of that year, I became involved in a number of other projects that unfortunately didn't go as well as I had hoped. Uh, I thought tonight uh, you might find it interesting to see just a few of the television pilots I made that never actually got on the air. <clears throat> uh, this one was called David Letterman, Gate Crasher at Large. <laughs> Each week I would show up at some kind of official function where I was neither expected nor wanted. And I like this one. This was a lot of fun to do. This series was called No Bones About It. This was a situation comedy about a bumbling osteopath. In this episode, the fun begins when Dr. Dave has to reconstruct his boss's spinal column and put it back before he awakens from the anesthetic. Now, this was an ABC series that was originally titled Migrant Comic. And, uh... In this show, I played wacky field entertainer Arnold Ducky Keeman. Here I am seen doing my famous hi, where you from routine to bored, disaffected youth right before they teach me some manners with a hoe. I'm... This was another good one. This was Open Occasionally, a zany situation comedy in which I played Donald Giesner, <laughs> a former talk show host who moves to Shelby, Montana to take over the family hat store. Seen at the right is kindly old general manager Edgar Creeley, who has only one problem, he's decomposing. <laughs> Awful notion, isn't it? Uh, this was a good one. The short-lived but critically acclaimed Dave Loves Muffins. In the opening episode, my doctor tells me I have only three weeks to live unless I consume several pounds of baked goods every day. So I construct a small muffin factory in my high-rise apartment. Well, let's see. This is a shot from a failed variety show. This was a good concept. Uh, it was called David Letterman Live from the Vatican. <laughs> there I am waiting for the opening act to finish up. Uh, lastly, oh, this was great fun to do. It was called Don't Drop Em. Dave's a washed-up juggler who needs a gimmick. Anne's a widow with four adorable newborns. When they get together, everything's up in the air. 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central Time. Just a few of the programs that never got on the air. No point in going to bed now. Coming up next, Stupid Pet Tricks. It's, uh, it's our feeling that uh, everyone who owns a pet has at one time tried to teach the animal to do something peculiar. So we have placed ads in new newspapers around the metropolitan area uh, to try and get folks who have taught their pets to do something peculiar or stupid. Of course, we do not believe the pets are stupid, but sometimes the little tricks they have been taught to do seem to be that way. So now we'd like to present to you our first installment of Stupid Pet Tricks. No, no. Not yet. Our first participant, Gene Meadow. Gene? Hi, Gene. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to 
This is Cindy. This is Cindy, Cindy yeah. a handsome-looking dog, if ever I saw one. Now, what will Cindy do for us, Jean? Well, Cindy's a very affectionate dog. She's a lover, mm -hmm. and she's going to show you how she kisses and hugs me. Okay. So we'll have her do that. Cindy? S Cindy? <laughs> Cindy? S Hello, Cindy. How are you? It's a very nice dog. Oh, oh yes. You sweet. love oh. me. You love me? Yes. Yes, you love me. Do kids like me. to be alone? Yes. Say hello to hello, David. Hello, Cindy. Say hello, David. Yes. Okay. That's yes. it? Oh. Thank you very much, Gene. We're going to take a look at that now through the miracle of slow motion instant replay. Gene Meadow and her dog, Cindy. Oh, yes. Sometimes it's more exciting in slow motion, isn't it? Gene has just donated Cindy to the show. Goodbye, Cindy. I wish I could do that. Uh, Kathy Ahern is our next partic participant, and her dog is Muggsy. Hello, Muggsy. Kathy, how are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Muggsy, how are you? What does Muggsy do? Sneeze for you. Okay. Right. Mugsy, cookie, sneeze. <laughs> no, not that. Pretty impressive. Stay. The other thing she'll do is we have. We a have one right here. over here. This is for Mugsy. Ah, yes. Okay. Stay. You can hold it right there if you want. Make I'll her hold the move. A distance I'll hold the phone, and, and Mugsy will do what now? She'll go answer. She'll answer the phone, okay. Why don't you back up and make her work a little bit. Oh, sure. Okay, well, she's, right, lower it she's looking. At, okay. She's looking. She knows what she's doing. There you go, Muggsy. Answer the phone. The phone's answer ringing. Answer the phone. Answer the phone. Quick. There you go. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Does she, does she do this at home? Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, what percentage of those calls usually turn out to be for the dog? <laughs> There you go. She All right, let's take, take a look at that again in slow. Oh, there it is. Instant replay. Muggsy answering the phone. Very nice. Very impressive. Thank you very much, Kathy. Goodbye, Muggsy. Uh, our next participant, Lanny Traeger, I believe, and Angel. Lanny, how are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, this is kind of a, a, a little heavy, this dog. About the size of a couch. <laughs> now, now, what will... Hi, Angel, how are you? What will Angel do? Angel will protect me from beating myself up. You're going to beat yourself up? On stage, right here. And, and the dog will protect you? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Lanny and Angel. Nice going, Angel. Nice job. You wanna... Angel is trained by the Reagan administration. Oh, I see. Corpy. You want to try that once more, or is that it? Is that as good as it gets? Here's the instant replay. Oh, he's been, oh. He's been struck down, and the dog gets a cab. Yes. Lanny, thank you very much. Angel, nice meeting you. Oh, boy. Uh, our next participant, Sherry Gross. Sherry? How do you do, Sherry? You have, uh, that's not a dog, that's a rabbit. You knew that. Okay, and your rabbit's name is? Thumper. Thumper, what will Thumper uh, do for us? First, she's gonna ride a skateboard. It's a lot of fun in traffic, isn't it? No, no. What else will Thumper do? She's gonna play dead life. Thumper will, Thumper will play dead. First of all, there's the replay of Thumper uh, on the skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like she enjoys it, doesn't she? Yeah. Now, now you're going to do what? Have her play dead. You're gonna have her play dead, and you hypnotize Thumper? Yeah. <laughs> 
That's it? It was very nice. Thank you very much. Sherry Gross and Thumper, thank you very much. You want to see the last? Here's... Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you very much, Sherry. Oh, boy. Our first installment of Stupid Pet Tricks. We'll be right back with Walter Killer Kowalski. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of our participants and their uh, animals uh, for making it a wonderfully successful Stupid Pet Tricks tonight. Uh, one of the meanest men ever to step into a wrestling ring, it says here, was Walter Killer Kowalski. In the area, area, <laughs> in the era of Gorgeous George, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, and Yukon Eric, the killer was the most feared and most loathed of all. He is now a professional photographer and runs the runs the Killer Kowalski Institute for Professional Wrestlers. It's right up there with Annapolis and the, uh, welcome please, Killer Kowalski. Walter Howard, have a seat there if you will. Yes, sir. Let me, uh, let me ask you something here about this introduction. It says that you were the most feared and most loathed of all, how, how would we prove that if we wanted to? Most loved. Oh, is it supposed to be loved? Love, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. That was, a, that was a, a typing error. Oh, a typing error. Oh, so you yes. were the most loved. Well, that's right. Yes, yes. Well, that's good. How many years have typing. you been wrestling? Oh, um, little, little years. Quite a few. <laughs> Quite a few, yeah. yes. How does a, a fellow, uh, as a youngster, become a professional wrestler? You know, to break into the... The sport is very, very difficult because most wrestling promoters don't even want to talk to anybody who is aspiring to become a professional wrestler. Why, why don't they want to talk to people? Because they, they never prove themselves. They, and they, they can't afford it. You know, with television, a lot of wrestling's on television. And you're drawing big houses. In fact, professional wrestling is the most watched sport and most attended sport from any other professional sport there is. Mm -hmm. Because we have wrestled so <clears throat> often. So that's yeah. all that are committed together produces a tremendous well, What would be attendance. the next sport after professional well, most of the sports are seasonal. I guess baseball, baseball. probably has the longest yeah. season. Yeah. So how did so, you get started then? If uh, nobody was talking was, to you, and then what happened? I went to a professional wrestling school in Detroit, Michigan. I was mm -hmm. a young kid working out at the YMCA, wrestling at the YMCA, and a wrestling promoter in Detroit. Heard of this big slob. And uh, he talked me to entering the profession. And I said, no, 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 I don't want nothing to do with it. Uh, I said, I want to constantly be here. Bell, I still do hear bells, birds singing, things like that. You do? <laughs> really? You don't? I hear sirens occasionally. <laughs> um, and sirens too. Yeah. So, you know. How did you get the name Killer? I'm guessing your folks didn't give you that name. <laughs> when I started wrestling, I started as named as Killer. Ko I mean, not Tarzan Kowalski. Tarzan Kowalski. A little incident you, happened. You, in you just changed it. Well, a lot of people in show business do that. They'll change their name. Yeah. <laughs> Had a good ring, Killer Kowalski. Killer too. Kowalski. Happened a little incident in Montreal. Actually, where the way it happened, I was climbing the top rope. I jumped off the top rope. I meant to jump on the guy's head, but he moved. <laughs> And I grazed his cheekbone. I said, I missed him. Mm -hmm. He had a very bad cauliflower ear. Mm -hmm. uh, cauliflower ear is very hard. It's, it's con blood flows to the ear, congeals. But his, his cartilage had broken his ear. And when I, my shin bone touched his cheek, it knocked like you would knock a fly off the table. That's where his ear went, rolling across the ring. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, uh, the referee says, you dirty slob. He says, you're not supposed to jump on him. I said, yeah, well, what the heck. He picked up, the, he pushed me across the ring. He starts, you know, this was Yukon Eric. He mm -hmm. a lot of publicity on that. He starts screaming, hollering my ear, my ear. I says, what are you hollering? I don't know something about an ear. Blood pouring out all over the place. And finally, he just stopped the match. He walked out of the ring. So he mm -hmm. threw a towel in, which was in moments was soaked in blood. He stepped out of the ring and the referee says, what am I going to do now? He says, he's gone. Give me the yeah. match. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. So he raised my arm. I was the winner for that. Yeah. And since then, People thought I was just a, a cruel monster. Mm -hmm. I had I sympathized with uh, yeah. poor Yukon Eric yeah. after that because do you, do you he get, had do you, no, get, do you get points for something like that? Yes, <laughs> they gave me 63 points for knocking an ear off that yeah. time. But you know Yukon Eric, he had a, a, a bit of a problem after that because when he used to try to go walking downtown down the street on a windy day, the wind would catch his good ear and spin him around. Very difficult. <laughs> 
Well, you know, you know some of these, these are some of the hazards, some of these are some of the hazards, you know, of, of different professions, even yeah. football, baseball, basketball, yeah. you know. It could happen. Imagine what happened to Howard stopped that ball in the big basketball thing. He swallows it. Hey. Probably happens more than you think, huh? Yes, uh, it certainly does. Now you're, but now, in addition to your uh, wrestling activities, you're a photographer. Yes, that little incident happened one time in Dallas, Texas. They wanted to, I saw the pictures that were using, they were using for publicity. Oh, here's, actually, this is the gentleman you alluded to earlier. This is Tarzan Kowalski. Yeah, 18 years old. Imagine that. Good heavens. <laughs> How, how, how big a fellow are you in this photo? What, uh... I'm right down about 245, 250. I was 18, 6 foot 6. I gained another inch, grew another inch to 6 foot 7. I got to be 275 and much ruggeder, much meaner, more cruel than mm -hmm. that. Cruel, yeah. Now, you didn't, uh, you didn't actually take that picture. Now, here's a fellow. Uh, who is this? Uh... That's Moose Monroe. Uh -huh. He was just running uh -huh. around this area here. He's a very sedate, mm -hmm. you know, easy-going fellow. Yeah, he eats little children or something like uh -huh. that, and, as well with his meals. Yeah. He, there's nothing much to him, though. You know, just, no. a, just a cruel, mean-looking guy. Mm -hmm. the, the word nair comes to mind. You know? Yes. <laughs> he, maybe he eats that, too. <laughs> this is uh, kind of a, a nice outfit. This is... Yeah, that's Larry Sharp. He was his own in New York, Italian. He's Larry. Here. This guy's name is Larry? Yeah, <laughs> that is Larry. Doesn't he look like a Larry? Oh, that's... Now, you, you take these and then you sell them to the restaurant? No, no, I, I use them for publicity. I've had my uh, pictures on my pictures on covers of magazines. Mm -hmm. that, that is the moon dogs, Rex and Fido, the last of the littler. Rex and who? Fido, the last of the little Rex moon dogs. Rex and Fido, the yeah, moon dog. Yeah, they're around here for uh -huh. uh, They're attorneys, I think, aren't they? Yes, they are, that's right. They okay, we're going uh, to have following. to interrupt this. We'll uh, continue. We're going to a commercial. We'll be uh, right back. <laughs> Other there, there are people in this country who, who believe that wrestling ain't on the up and up, that it's fixed and that the matches are predetermined and that... Uh... You know, most of the fans who mention that are all television wrestling fans. Mm -hmm. You sit home, watch wrestling on television, it is a commercial. Mm -hmm. There's a guy my size wrestling somebody half your size, it's, the outcome is obvious. It's I'm doing a job to promote Killer Kowalski. So I wouldn't look too good against another great wrestler. So I get in the ring with a guy who is just a little small guy, guy, a little yeah. wimp. Yeah. And I just beat him. To, first, I'm not going to hurt him. No. Otherwise, no. I would run out of wimps yeah. to beat up. Uh, so, not, enough, not enough wimps to go around. <laughs> That's right. Uh, OK, now, I don't know exactly how you answered that. Who is, uh, who is this guy? That's Andre the Giant. Uh -huh. He's a seven foot four, 500 pounds, a real giant. How did, how do you, sense of the word. how do you do on his SATs? Do you have to... Well, he's in a bit of an attraction there. Big guy. He's yeah. a, a yeah. monster. Really Is there a lot of money to be made for a wrestler uh, these days? Yes, if you're a main event, there's, you can make a good, good living, but you're wrestling five, four, five times a week. Yeah, it's That's tough, all. huh? And you have to keep in condition, you travel a lot. Sometimes you don't even get to bed two or three days at a time. Would you, you know? travel all over the United States or just in a certain uh, geographic well, region? Some ply, sometimes the uh, wrestlers come in a geographical region, but region, but like uh, under the giant, he travels all over the world. Yeah. He'd be in Tokyo, Japan one day, he'd be in Washington, D.C. next day, and then he'd fly to Africa or something like that. What, what does a well known wrestler make in a week? Say a, a guy, a top known wrestler. Well, they make not as great a salary as boxers or some of the other great players, but they make 3000 a week. Yeah. What's the low end of the scale? What's the least a guy would make in wrestling? Three, 400 a week. Yeah, that would be a wimp, I guess, would that make could that. Be a wimp, I guess. <laughs> okay, and finally, we got another photograph that you've taken. That's These, uh, Superstar the boys Billy next door. Superstar yeah. Billy Graham and uh, his manager, the wizard, Grand Wizard, and Stan Stasiak. Looks a little like my manager, come to think of it. Uh, I, I want to thank you very much, Walter, for being here. Now, you have a television show. Uh, where is that? We're in Boston, Boston 25. We have a show every Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. It's a Christian broadcasting network, mm -hmm. and uh, Kenneth Copeland is on just before me. He lifts the people up and makes them ready to go into heaven. And boy, I come on at 11 o'clock, I bring them right back down to earth yeah. and let them know what the real thing, that's the real thing right here. Killer Kowalski, Boston thank you very much. Uh, we have to uh, turn things off here tonight. I want to thank the studio audience. You folks have been terrific. 
And of course, uh, Paul Schaefer and the gentleman in the orchestra, Bill Wendell, our announcer. Now, coming up Monday, humorist Henry Morgan, pitchman Dave Clark, Francis Ford Coppola will be here. Also, a feature we like to call Celebrities and Their Business Machines. And a look at the fabulous February 8th Day Parade here in New York City. The theme this year is Cardboard on Wheels. Have a good weekend, folks. As we come to an end of another week of shows, we present from St. Dominic's Old Roman Catholic Church in Brooklyn, the Reverend Bishop Andre Pinaccio. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Today marks the beginning of a weekend of rest. After being through the icy storms, stalled subway cars and buses and facing above all a tyrant boss who doesn't understand why we are late for work dear lord give me courage to make it through monday thank god it's friday thursday central amen <laughs>